Robertson from the Lexington Veterans Association. And I'm happy to welcome you to a pres presentation on revisiting the day of infamy, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Normally, a group of our fellow veterans view this program from the Edith Norse Rogers Memorial Veterans Hospital in Bedford, Massachusetts. But today they're unable to join due to a non-COVID event. They'll view the recorded program later. But we do want to offer a special thank you to Andrea Vinci, recreational therapist. These programs mean a lot to our fellow veterans at the VA and Andrea makes viewing them possible. We open this program today with a special tribute to Winston Pat Flynn, a veteran of World War II, Korea and Vietnam, holder of three combat infantry badges and five Purple Hearts. Pat Flynn died on December 5 at the Bedford VA Hospital at the age of 97. He made immeasurable contributions to our nation and its military and to the town of Lexington. I would like to share some highlights of Pat's life of service. Pat Flynn served three years in the European theater during World War II in Italy and France, mostly on the front lines where he experienced danger, deprivation, and suffering. In one mission, pinned down by machine gun fire in a shallow depression, lying in rain, snow, and ice, his feet became badly frozen, requiring evacuation by donkey down perilous mountain paths. After a few months of hospital care, he was back on the front lines. In Anzio, he was buried alive when a shell exploded directly over his foxhole, killing his buddy. After another hospital stay, his unit was reassigned for the invasion of Southern France, where Pat was wounded again. In Korea, Pat received a battlefield commission. <clears throat> he was asked to form a new company and learned that he had been given the discards from other units. Undaunted, he told his men that everyone assumed they weren't worth much and they would surely fail, but they were going to prove everyone wrong. His unit rose to the challenge and performed with distinction. In 1951, Pat became one of the first hand-picked members of the elite special forces known as the Green Berets. He became a master parachutist and an instructor in survival training, escape and evasion, and demolitions. His active career ended when a gust of wind caught his parachute during a uh, combat jump in Vietnam, slamming him into a Buddhist temple and breaking nearly every bone on the left side of his body. He completed his military career on the command staff of the ROTC unit at the University of Illinois. In 1973, Pat and his wife Edith moved to Lexington, Massachusetts. And Pat became an administrator at MIT until his retirement in 1990. Pat spent the next 30 years in service to the town of Lexington. He chaired the town celebrations committee for many years. He initiated the popular veterans breakfast still held to this day. He spearheaded the founding of the Lexington Youth Commission, which annually recognizes two Lexington High School students for their superior academic performance, leadership, and active citizenship. Pat became, became the veteran's services officer and always put the interests and welfare of his fellow veterans first. He regularly held coffee hours with World War II veterans who sat around 
telling stories about their military service. These sessions became more and more popular. They eventually moved to Cary Library and became known as the Lexington Veterans Association. And so we have our founder, Pat Flynn, to thank for the vibrant organization we all participate in today. Pat and his life partner and wife of 64 years, Edith, have remained active members of the Lexington Veteran Association. Edith is a member of our executive board. Please join me in a brief moment of silence as we bid farewell to a comrade in arms, a dear friend, and a true patriot. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dan Breen. Dan Breen grew up in Atlanta where he developed a passion for history and no surprise, the Civil War in particular. He earned a BA in history from the University of Wisconsin and a law degree from the University of Georgia. After briefly practicing law, he earned a master's degree in history from the University of Georgia and a PhD from Boston College. He began his teaching career at Framingham State College. He taught history at Newbury College in Brookline before moving to Brandeis University, where he is currently a senior lecturer in legal studies. Dan considers the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor one of the most important events of the 20th century. Here to explain why is Dan Breen. Thank you, everybody. So what I'm now going to do is uh, beat that hour of doom, always anticipated by Zoom lecturers, uh, which is the sharing of the screen moment. Uh, so let's see if everything goes OK. There's my slide so far. Now I'll start from the beginning. Uh, and there you have my very creative title uh, for today's presentation, Pearl Harbor. And we don't have a lot of time to get into the reasons why the Japanese made their catastrophically bad decision to attack the United States in the first place. Uh, but suffice it to be said that as of 1940 and for three years before that, the Japanese had been involved in what amounted to a quagmire in China, a war they really couldn't win. And so what they finally decided to do was face this choice. In order to get the war, raw materials, they were going to need to continue prosecuting this war, this endless war. They were going to have to come to some accommodation with the United States, but that was precisely what they could not do as long as they were in China fighting this war. So what they finally decided to do, or what they finally decided that they had to do, uh, rather than take the rational step, which was to withdraw from China, what they finally decided to do was attack south into the Dutch East Indies in the British colonies in Malaya, and uh, that would give them at least access to the raw materials down there. But in order to do that, as they well knew, they were going to have to face the almost certain prospect of war with the United States. After all, there's the Philippines, our possession right in the way of the Japanese uh, in their course of that movement south. And so by 1940, they had agreed in principle that they would attack south at a point, even if that meant war with the United States. And in 1941, they finally made the final decision indeed to attack the United States. Now, the only question left was exactly how they would do that. Now, they, they knew they were going to go south, and much of their forces would be going south, and that amounted to, among other things, an attack on the Philippines, as well as Hong Kong, the Dutch East Indies, and Malaya. But would that be all? Uh, would that be all to the Japanese attack, as it would take place in the fall of 1941? And the answer to that question, of course, was going to be no. Uh, and the reason was a decision that took the Japanese by surprise in 1940 one they didn't make, but one the President of the United States made, Franklin Roosevelt. So what governed the actual Japanese decision ultimately to attack a Pearl Harbor was Franklin Roosevelt's decision in 1940 to move the main base of the Pacific Fleet from San Diego, where it had been for a long time, here to Pearl Harbor in Oahu in the Hawaiian Islands. 
Uh, now this uh, harbor, Pearl Harbor, is one of the great natural harbors in the Pacific. And originally it was called Pearl Harbor by the Hawaiians because it was teeming with oysters. And there were plenty of pearls coming out of those oysters. And that's why the Hawaiians refer to this as uh, the Great Pearl River. And as a matter of fact, they were right about that because Pearl Harbor is actually the uh, joining point of several long, ge in, the, in the geologic past, uh, several uh, entities that had been rivers coming together here, eventually inundated uh, at the end of the last ice age. And uh, that inundation would eventually give us this harbor. Uh, those oysters were eventually all fished out, I'm sorry to say, by the 1840s. There were hardly any of them left by the late 19th century, but that didn't matter to the United States. They wanted this anchorage for the fleet. Not only would this be a really good coaling station, but uh, should the worst come to worst in the event of war, this would be an anchorage that would be reasonably safe from enemy attack, uh, should that actually happen. So in 1887, the uh, United States acquired Pearl Harbor as a base for its Navy, or at least one of the bases for its Navy. And to maintain possession of that, in 1898, the US made the decision to annex Hawaii. And as a matter of fact, had it not been for Pearl Harbor, it may be that the United States would never have made that decision, but the decision was made and Pearl Harbor and Hawaii was added to US dominions uh, by 1898. And by the way, before we continue, I'm glad to say that the oysters of Pearl Harbor have begun making a comeback. They're small, small oysters, very tasty, and uh, eventually maybe there'll be a thriving industry there, as there was about 200 years ago. Now, by 1940, and this was why the decision to put the Pacific Fleet there was controversial, Pearl Harbor was nowhere near as complete a naval base as San Diego was. And that's why a lot of the higher ups in the Navy didn't like this decision by President Roosevelt one bit. And as a matter of fact, the uh, former commander of the Pacific Fleet had protested the decision, and that's why in 1941, early 1941, that man was replaced. But President Roosevelt thought this was the right decision, and the reason he thought that was if the Pacific Fleet was in Pearl Harbor, that might deter Japan from any further expansionist tendencies, not just in China, but also to the South. Maybe the Japanese would see this fleet there and decide to think twice before any further advance to the south. After all, this would mean the Pacific fleet was a lot closer to Japan than it was in San Diego. Think of it this way. It was as if Franklin Roosevelt was putting the queen as a chess player in the middle of the board. The queen being the US Pacific fleet. But if you play chess, you know it's not always a good idea to have your queen isolated in the middle of the board. And the problem with President Roosevelt doing it this way was that the leader, the commander of the combined fleet in Japan was this man, Isoroku Yamamoto, and Yamamoto was a bit of a gambler. And as a chess player, if he saw that queen at the middle of the board, he's not gonna interpret that as a threat to be perhaps intimidated by, he's gonna interpret that the way he did, an opportunity, and in fact, a priceless opportunity, because Isoroku Yamamoto was by nature a gambler. He loved to gamble. He was, in fact, a master of the Chi uh, Japanese form of chess, uh, shoji. Uh, and wherever he went all around the world, if there was a casino there, Yamamoto was sure to visit that casino. He was actually a very good gambler. And at times in his life, he appears to have toyed with the notion of resigning from the Navy and even making a living as a gambler, going from casino to casino to casino. And if all went well, uh, maybe getting rich. He was a curious figure altogether. Yamamoto was. At the drop of a hat with no warning, seemingly for no reason at all, he might actually uh, do a headstand uh, just to impress whomever he was around. Uh, he was also somebody who enjoyed doing Charlie Chaplin impersonations uh, for his geisha girlfriend, uh, who he very often, uh, with no show of embarrassment, would bring on to stay with him on a ship if it happened to be nearby in harbor. And as a gambler, he was very good at calculating odds and when it came to the big odds, when it came to the big question, should Japan make war with the United States, Yamamoto's answer was always a categorical no. He didn't like the odds there. And in fact, the odds that Japan would win such a war, as Yamamoto uh, well knew, uh, were just about non-existent. Japanese had no chance at all to win this war. And by the way, while we're on the topic, if you ever wanted to design a governmental system, to be as inefficient and bad at making good decisions as possible, you would choose the Japanese government in uh, 1940. Uh, that was a system in which the Navy and the Army had independent decision-making authority, and neither one of them wanted to look weak in front of the other. 
So even though the army knew they couldn't win a war with the United States, uh, they agreed to fight the United States. And even though the Navy knew there was no way to win this war, they agreed to fight because neither the army nor the Navy wanted to look weak in front of the other. Yamamoto himself, though, was under no illusions about this. He said, quote, it is madness to fight the United States. Fighting the United States, Yamamoto said, is like fighting a war against the entire world. He had opposed the alliance with Germany. He had opposed the idea of fighting in China. Uh, but after all, he was a soldier. And now that the higher ups have made the decision to fight the United States, uh, there was only one thing for him to do, and that is to try to find a way to fight the war uh, as best as possible and as efficiently as possible. Uh, the fact that he was against war was well known in Japan, and that's one reason he was commander of the combined fleet. His friends wanted to make sure that he was usually offshore or at least having his headquarters on a naval vessel because if he was on land, there was always a pretty good chance he might be assassinated by one of the ultra militarists who had so much power in Japan at the time. But once the decision for war had been made, he went into the project of finding out a way to fight that war as well as possible. Even though he knew that for him, probably he would never see the end of it. Uh, he very famously said that the only thing for him to do now was plan this war, even though that meant he would probably die on his flagship, the Nagato. That's the Nagato before you there. Uh, in fact, of course, as we know, he wouldn't die in the Nagato. He was shot down over the Solomons, Bougainville in 1943. And ironically enough, the Nagato, his flagship, was one of the only ships of the Imperial Japanese Navy to survive World War II. It was still there in the Inland Sea in 1945. Now, the Japanese had long assumed that if war came, there would be a titanic, decisive clash of battleships. As the US Pacific Fleet made its way uh, towards the Western Pacific to take on the Japanese as they moved south. And a lot of people had long thought that the decisive battle would take place somewhere around the US possession in the Philippines. But Yamamoto did not think that things would actually happen this way. Why would the Americans, in the event of a war, be foolish enough to steam all the way west across the Pacific to give battle around the Philippines, or perhaps even closer to China, where Japanese land-based bombers might actually make the decisive difference? Yamamoto did not think, when it came to that, the Americans would be so foolish to give the Japanese that advantage. Uh, and in fact, he was right about that. Uh, the Americans had decided not to fulfill what was usually known as War Plan Orange, that is fighting the decisive battle in the Western Pacific. Uh, the Americans had decided to pay attention to events, see what happened, and then use the Pacific Fleet to react uh, to the best, most promising opportunity. Uh, so what Yamamoto decided to do was not wait for the Americans to show up when the Americans wanted and where the Americans wanted. What he decided to do instead was strike the United States Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. And it was Roosevelt's decision to put the, Pearl, to put the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor that gave him the opportunity to make that decision. Uh, Roosevelt's queen would be struck and maybe even captured at the opening moments of the war. If, in fact, the battleships and especially the carriers could be destroyed at Pearl Harbor, then Yamamoto thought the Japanese may have as much of a year in full reign in the Pacific without any meaningful American response. And within that year, maybe, just maybe, the Japanese could expand so much far south and so much to the southwest that pushing back the Japanese would be so ruinously expensive, uh, not just in money, but especially in lives, that eventually, maybe, the Americans would agree to make some sort of deal, a deal that would leave the Japanese at least controlling wide aspects of China, which was the war they were mainly worried about uh, to begin with. Uh, as far as the actual attack on Pearl Harbor, Yamamoto thought maybe the odds of succeeding, uh, destroying the battleships and the carriers were a little better than 50%. Maybe those were the odds that the Japanese would win this engagement, take the Americans by surprise, and although a lot of commanders wouldn't like those odds uh, better than 50%, Yamamoto, gambler that he was, thought those odds were pretty good. And that's why he demanded that part of the initial Japanese decision to make war would be an attack on the Pacific Fleet, a surprise attack at Pearl Harbor. Now, the higher ups in the Japanese military did not like this idea, but with Yamamoto threatening to resign unless they agreed, finally, he was given the green light, not just to plan, but to execute the attack on Pearl Harbor while other Japanese forces moved south towards Hong Kong, Malaya, the Dutch East Indies, and indeed the Philippines. So the fleet that would be bound for Pearl Harbor 
what's known as the Kido Butai, which just means mobile fleet. And it was going to consist of six aircraft carriers, the greatest force of aircraft carriers ever assembled, as well as escorts of cruisers, battleships, submarines, uh, and destroyers. And they were going to gather here uh, at Hitukapu Bay in the southern Kuril Islands in November to get ready for the attack uh, once the final word was given to permit it. That war with the United States would indeed happen, uh, and that word would be given uh, later on in November. So the idea was to smash the American fleet and hope for the best. Uh, here's that anchorage at Hitukapu Bay uh, that you see before you. Now, th the chances of success in this war, as I said, uh, were practically nil. Uh, the Japanese were always impressed by the statistic that the American industrial capacity was at least 75 times what Japan's was. In the event of a long war, uh, simply no good way the Japanese were going to win. But there was that slight chance that maybe they could force a negotiated peace somewhere along the line. And on that slight chance, uh, the war was now going to be embarked upon. Uh, one of the most famous quotes of uh, that period was Prime Minister Tojo's quote, when asked why embark upon a war when the odds are so terrible. And Tojo simply responded, uh, well, sometimes, sometimes he said, you just have to take a leap off the stage at Kiyomitsu, a famous Japanese idiom, which means sometimes you just have to take the plunge. And here's that stage, that platform at Kiyomitsu. And the reason that's an idiom, the reason Tojo said that was that back in the 19th century and before, people used to jump off that platform because the idea was that if you survived that jump, you would be granted one wish, maybe your heart's desire. It was eventually made illegal, but not before a lot of people did jump off that platform at Kiyomitsu outside of Kyoto. And in fact, Tojo was a bit wrong to use that idiom, I think, because the chances of the Japanese actually coming to some successful conclusion uh, were practically minuscule, uh, whereas at Kiyomitsu, about 84% of those who jumped actually survived. Uh, so the idiom was mischosen, uh, and in fact, the Japanese now embarked upon this war that, as a practical matter, they could not hope uh, but to lose. So when all the ships had arrived at that anchorage, there it is, uh, in the southern Kurals, there were about 30 vessels, uh, if you count the submarines, and the main tactical problem they had uh, this is Rikaku, uh, it's one of the Japanese aircraft carriers. The main tactical problem that they had, as many of you know, was that Pearl Harbor was a place where the depths of the water was only about 40 feet. And as everybody knew uh, who was planning the attack, uh, the torpedo bombers, if they're going to be successful in the usual kind of attack, uh, would drop those torpedoes and the torpedoes needed 100 feet into the ocean before they would stabilize and start going towards the target. Well, how on earth was this attack going to work if Pearl Harbor was 40 feet and the torpedoes needed 100 feet? They had to figure that out. And although the solution has always been a bit controversial, a lot of people don't quite understand exactly what they did. The main innovation to the torpedoes that would make Pearl Harbor possible for the Japanese was the inclusion of very small fins, not at the back of the torpedo, but rather at the front of the torpedo, and that uh, combined with a, another stabilizing set of fins that would reduce the spin of the torpedo as it entered the water, allow the torpedo to plunge and then to right itself much more quickly so that within 40 feet, it would still be able to avoid the mud of Pearl Harbor and proceed towards the targets. At least if all went well and the torpedoes were dropped by bombers like these at a very low altitude. Uh, the torpedo was the famous thunderfish of the Japanese Navy. And now that the Thunderfish was ready, apparently with those fins in the front, if all went well, uh, that meant that maybe the attack could proceed. And they just really figured that out uh, on a final basis uh, in mid to late November, just in time for the attack. And the man who would be in command of the Kido Butai, uh, as it steamed eventually from Hidukapu Bay, was this man, Admiral Nugamo, Chuchi Nugamu, Nugumu. Uh, and he did not believe this attack was actually going to achieve surprise. He rather figured that maybe half his ships are going to be sunk. He was a bit pessimistic about this. Uh, the fact was that Nagumo had terrible arthritis. Uh, he seemed older than his 54 years. He really wasn't an expert on naval aviation anyway. And a lot of people thought he really shouldn't be in command of the Kido Butai uh, in the physical shape that he was in and with a pessimistic mindset that he had. But the fact was that he had seniority. He was probably the logical choice for command uh, from that perspective. 
Uh, and that's why against the protests of some younger officers, he found himself in command of the Kido Butai. And also the fact was that although Nguma was a bit pessimistic, he wasn't the only one who didn't think this attack was gonna actually be a surprise. Many of the flyers and many of the crew members also thought the same thing. And that's why as the fleet began to proceed from the Southern Kuriles, many of them, the last thing they did was they wrote out last words to their loved ones, letters that would be sent uh, as soon as the attack had actually happened, saying goodbye, wishing them well, and saying that this is how we'd like to be remembered. And one of the crew members actually, and I think several of them probably did this, put locks of their hair in the envelope so that something tangible from their bodies could be remembered by their surviving loved ones. Many of them really did not think they were coming back. Well, before leaving, Nagumo looked over the last intelligence messages that they had from Pearl Harbor, and he was bitterly disappointed, as Yamamoto was as well, to learn that at least as of the last week in November, the American carriers were not at Pearl Harbor. Well, maybe they would show up there later. Uh, there was no turning back now. And so on November 26th, in a heavy mist, the fleet set off. First the submarines, then the destroyers, then the battleships, and finally the six carriers of the Kido Butai, all of them firing their guns in salute as they left Hitokapu Bay. And because of what was about to happen, Hitokapu Bay is no longer Hitokapu Bay, it is now Kasatka Bay, a possession of Russia. While the fleet took its time, traveling only 14 knots while maintaining absolute radio silence for the time being, because after all, this was supposed to be kept and really needed to be kept a complete secret. The day after the fleet left on November 27th, based on diplomatic intelligence that had arrived in Washington, uh, the US Navy issued a war warning to all the facilities in the Pacific, the assumption being that the Japanese probably were going to attack targets to the south, maybe even including the Philippines. But nothing was said about a potential attack on Pearl Harbor, at least not yet. And so eastward through the Central Pacific went the Kidu Butai, the greatest carrier force ever assembled in utter secrecy day after day. And he received their route. That's the line a little bit to the north, uh, leaving the Southern Kuriles. Uh, into the great expanse in the emptiness of the Central and Northern Pacific. And it was truly an amazing voyage. Through those cold waters, the fleet made its way, surrounded by nothing at all but emptiness. Against all odds, they encountered nothing on the way. The carriers plowed through the water in the middle, surrounded by the destroyers in the cruisers in the battleships, and all the officers and all the enlisted men in the fleet had to know that with every turn of the great propellers of the Kido Butai, Japan was coming closer and closer and closer to whatever would be its destiny. Their masters had settled upon the ultimate roll of the dice and they were the dice. As Yamamoto well knew, the Japanese could well lose the war on the very first day of the Great Pacific War, or maybe perhaps at least for a while, they could make the Pacific the greatest ocean in the world, at least for a while, a Japanese lake. Now commanding the Pacific fleet was this man here, that's Admiral Husband Kimmel uh, of Henderson, Kentucky, one of the very few men whose uh, father fought both on the Confederate and the Union side during the Civil War. His nickname Husband Kimmel's was, for obvious reasons, was Hubby, but his nickname, yet another one, was uh, Mustafa, and if we have time uh, after our discussion today, we'll talk about how we got that nickname. Nicknames in the Navy uh, sometimes had very strange origins. Uh, his friend, the Chief of Naval, Naval Operations, Admiral Harold Stark, his nickname was Betty. And we might talk about how we got that nickname a little bit later as well. But there's Kimmel, uh, who owed his position, as I said before, to the fact that unlike the previous commander, he had never publicly protested the placement of the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. Now, everyone respected Kimmel's dedication. They respected his work ethic. He'd succeeded at everything he'd ever done in the Navy, but not everyone liked his style. Some people might call him a bit of a martinet. He was a stickler for rules. He conducted endless inspections, endless drills once he became commander, training maneuvers as often as he could get away with ordering them. And no detail seemed to be beyond his interest. He was not too good at delegating authority 
Uh, he liked to do things himself, hands-on. Among the things he was paying attention to, for example, uh, were the numbers of rounds of ammunition deposited on bases far away from Pearl Harbor. Even details like that were things that he was interested in and uh, demanded to put his own special stamp and attention on. Uh, he would uh, inspect at the drop of a dime and sailors kind of thought he must have x-ray vision because if there was anything wrong during these inspections, he would usually notice it. Uh, and he would call to task anybody responsible for whatever, whatever that was. Uh, he, and he had some really impressive attributes of a, a good administrator uh, and certainly a good disciplinarian. But what he didn't have was that one indispensable element of all great commanders, the ability to put himself in the shoes of his adversary and anticipate what that adversary might be likely to do. When his friend, Admiral Stark, as I said, Chief of Naval Operations, uh, issued one of the most famous messages in the history of the Navy, the war warning of the last week of November, 1941. Kimmel did not interpret that warning as any kind of a message that maybe Pearl Harbor itself might be under threat. He chose to interpret it quite literally as simply a message that possessions to the South, especially the Philippines, might well be imminently threatened by the Japanese Navy. Uh, and for that reason, he continued to believe that an attack on Pearl Harbor was extremely unlikely and probably not going to happen. Uh, when his intelligence officer told him that they had no idea about the whereabouts of six of the Japanese carriers, in fact, actually four of the Japanese carriers, one way to interpret that might be that maybe they're headed towards Pearl Harbor. The way you would know where the carriers might be is if they've been sending messages. Uh, and so Kimmel chose to interpret this fact uh, to lead him to think that the carriers were still in home waters. Uh, and that way they naturally wouldn't be sending out radio messages. Well, he could have interpreted to think they might be having radio silence on the way across the Pacific, but he just didn't choose to interpret it that way. Uh, most unfortunately, he did not order PBY patrols north of Oahu to take care of the possibility that maybe, just maybe, those missing carriers might be to his north rather than many thousands of miles to his west. His entire mindset was based upon the war beginning, if at all, much to the south and much to the southwest, at which point, should the Japanese attack the Philippines, Kimmel was planning on sorting, uh, sortying from Pearl Harbor and attacking Japanese garrisons in the Marshall Islands about 2,000 miles away. So for Kimmel, in his mindset, that's what the war would be. Uh, and here, Admiral Stark believed the same thing, that the Japanese would attack south, attack the Philippines, leaving the United States with the freedom of action to send the Pacific fleet where it would, maybe first against the Marshall Islands. Uh, locked in that way of thinking, Kimmel uh, chose to believe without question his battleship commander, Admiral Pai, when Pai told him there's virtually no chance the Japanese will attack Pearl Harbor. Uh, he chose to believe his operations officer, the usual commendable, uh, Admiral McMorris, when McMorris said the same thing. There were no torpedo nets in Pearl Harbor because the Americans assumed there was no way torpedoes could do much damage for the reasons that we've already seen. Uh, and so without those PBY patrols, uh, might have been ordered, uh, even though they weren't. There weren't many of those patrol planes, but some could have been ordered on patrol. There was no way for the United States to know that the Kido Butai was approaching Pearl Harbor and getting closer all the time. So here, in my view, was the classic failing of all too many commanders, from Lord Howe to uh, General McClellan to General Westmoreland. Uh, and that's the assumption that your enemy is going to do what you think your enemy will do, what you would do if you were the enemy, rather than what the enemy could do. And in fact, what a gambler like Yamamoto was all too likely to do. Now, going back to our map, on December 3rd, the Kido Butai, you can see this uh, towards the right of the map, uh, was approaching a position to the uh, northwest of Oahu, still steaming pretty slowly at that time, because the idea was to attack at 8 a.m. on December 7th a half hour after Japanese diplomats in Washington would officially have broken off all talks, the negotiations that were then ongoing. By December 6th, as you can see, the Japanese had moved con uh, considerably to the Southeast uh, and there were unmistakable intentions or unmistakable indications in Washington that in fact, the Japanese were going to attack at least the Philippines and point South. Evidence of troop movements to the south abounded, 
And as Washington knew, Japanese diplomats had been ordered to destroy their papers, probably in anticipation of war. This means war, Roosevelt had said, although what they were thinking was the war again would begin in the Philippines into the South, and they still weren't thinking of Pearl Harbor. And there in the vast and silent Northern Pacific, uh, by December 6th, there were heavy seas and rain, a welcome development for Admiral Nagumo because that would further shield the fleet from observers as they got closer and closer to Oahu. By the afternoon of December 6th, the sun was out over Oahu. Hawaiians were looking forward to a big football game between Willamette University and the University of Hawaii that was gonna take place that afternoon in Honolulu. And the papers in Honolulu were filled with rumors of Japanese troop movements to the south, towards Hong Kong, towards Malaya, maybe the Dutch East Indies, maybe the Philippines. As in Washington, Japanese diplomats began the process of putting together the language for the very last note to be delivered to Secretary of State Cordell Hall. Now that Saturday morning, it's December 6th, Nagumo, still believing that somehow he was probably going to meet with disaster, was informed by Tokyo that in fact, latest intelligence from their spy on Oahu had indicated that the carriers were still not at Pearl Harbor. As the last radio message he would receive from Tokyo was to that effect. And here's their spy, uh, the very capable Tokeo Yoshigawa, who had been driving his car all around Pearl Harbor for a long time, keeping track of the ships that were actually there from day to day and week by week. And calling him a spy, is a little bit strange because all you had to do to figure out where the battleships were and the cruisers were and everything else at Pearl Harbor were was just drive around the rim of the harbor. There were plenty of places where you could just look down and see what was down there. And, uh, and that's what he had been reporting on. Uh, he would usually drive around in a nondescript car, often wearing a kind of a, a classic Hawaiian shirt as if he was just a tourist. And his last message indicated, unfortunately, that the carriers weren't there. In fact, the carriers were elsewhere. The Saratoga was back in San Diego getting some repairs. The Lexington was on its way to Midway Island to deliver some planes. And on a similar mission, Admiral Halsey was leading uh, at that time the Enterprise uh, towards Wake Island. And that's why they were not at Pearl Harbor. But as Yoshigawa said, there were eight battleships at the anchorage and to Commander Ginda, uh, who was in charge of much of the planning for this operation, as disappointing as the lack of carriers were, at least the battleships were gonna present a very appetizing target indeed. After all, what a lot of people still thought in 1941 was that if there was going to be a great decisive battle in this war, it would involve lines of battleships. That's what all decisive naval battles had been, lines of battleships ever since the 16th century when the galleys gave way to the great men of war. From Trafalgar to Manila Bay to Tsushima in 1905, the great decisive battles on the ocean and world history had been fought by lines of battleships. Why wouldn't this war be any different? And so it was not such bad news that uh, the battleships were actually there, maybe not the carriers. Meanwhile, that same day and into the night, Admiral Kimmel made an appearance at a gathering of naval officers at uh, this facility here, the Halakulani Hotel in Honolulu, uh, where many people were gathering after that football game. It was a celebration he kind of felt he had to attend. But as usual with him, he just nursed one drink throughout the celebration. And then he got in his car and went home as the strains of the band receded from his ears. They were playing Sweet Leilani and Lovely Hulahans uh, at the party that night. Kimmel wanted to make sure he was home early because he had an early morning golf appointment with his counterpart with the army, General Walter Short. And General Short also was not anticipating an attack on Pearl Harbor. His worry was sabotage. And that's why the US Army Air Corps planes at Pearl Harbor were all parked wing to wingtip to wingtip to wingtip in nice neat rows as protection against sabotage. He was not thinking about an attack on Pearl Harbor. He was in fact assuming that such an attack would be easy to detect because Kimmel, he thought, was flying those patrol planes north of Oahu that might actually uh, catch sight of any fleet before it could actually launch an attack and do much damage. By the early hours of December 7th, as Nagumo fretted, uh, hoping that the surprise could be maintained, 
uh, perhaps the happiest man in the Pacific fleet was this man. And that is Lieutenant William Uderbridge, who was enjoying his very first independent command in the Navy as commander of the USS Ward, the destroyer of Ward, an old relic from the First World War. Uderbridge was very happy because until a couple of days before this, before December 7th, he'd been serving under a commander on the USS Cummings that he really detested. And he'd been trying to get out of that berth that he had on that destroyer for a long time. And they finally listened to him and they put him in command of the ward. And he was just overjoyed to be out under the thumb of that captain and in his own command. And there he was on the ward off, as you see here, the uh, coast of Pearl Harbor, engaging in that usual boring destroyer duty, picket duty, going back and forth, patrolling the entrance of Pearl. And that's where he was trying to get a little bit of rest in his cot in the very early morning hours of December 7th. He had no sooner dozed off and was enjoying a little bit of a sleep than he was awakened by somebody who demanded that Woodbridge, as commander of the vessel, come to the bridge. And there he was told that there had been reports of a strange submarine in the waters just off the entrance to Pearl Harbor. And it looked as if that submarine, whatever it was, might be trying to get into Pearl Harbor, maybe following an American ship in order to get through the submarine nets without being detected. And then they saw a periscope and Uderbridge, still just dressed in the kimono, which is what he'd been wearing when he got out of his cot, gave the order to attack that tiny sub. And the reason he did that was that once Stark had issued the war warning back in the last week of November, Kimmel, to his credit, had given the order to attack uh, any unauthorized submarine off the coast of Pearl Harbor. And that's exactly what Woodbridge now proceeded to do. Uh, and he did, in fact, attack the uh, Japanese midget submarine, as they were called, uh, just before dawn on December 7th. And as the sun was just beginning to rise, they sunk that midget submarine, the very first engagement of the Great Pacific War, the greatest of all naval wars in the annals of human history, was begun by the destroyer Ward attacking that little midget submarine. Uh, they did sink the sub, as I said, a little two-man mini sub bent on entering Pearl. And Uderbridge dutifully, once he had done that, sent word back to Pearl Harbor that he had engaged an enemy submarine. And that word reached the duty officer at Pearl Harbor as the sun was coming up, but the duty officer didn't do anything about it. No response at all to this intelligence that maybe the Japanese might be up to something outside Pearl. In fact, five of these mini subs did try to enter Pearl Harbor uh, over the course of the morning to come. None of them made it. All of them were either sunk or they ran aground. And all of the Japanese sailors on the mini subs were killed, except for there's an example of a mini sub. This man here, uh, and that's Kazuo Sakamaki. Uh, who actually survived his own mini sub as it ran aground on a reef and was taken prisoner by US authorities, making him the very first POW of the Pacific War. He would eventually survive the war. He pleaded to be allowed to kill himself shortly after he was captured. And the Japanese government thought this was a disgrace that somebody on a midget sub would be captured by US authorities, and he didn't admit to it for a long time. Ultimately, though, he was able, after the war, to go back to Japan, and he eventually became a very high-ranking executive for Toyota, didn't much like talking about the war and his experiences. But eventually, when he was in his 70s, he journeyed to the United States, where his sub, which was captured uh, in December of 1941, was on display at a museum in Texas. Uh, Kazuo Sakamaki took a look at that sub, and he broke down in tears uh, in 1991 as he, for the first time, came to grips with a tangible reminder of the most terrifying and meaningful moment of his life. Now, at about the same time, Uderbridge was sinking that mini sub off the coast of Pearl uh, as the sun was coming up 250 miles north of Oahu, tension among the Japanese flyers was now at a fever pitch. The time had come to launch, about 6.15 AM. Nagumo's heart was pounding through his chest. Like Uderbridge, as he saw the sun coming up, uh, he realized that, that uh, a grand decision had to be made, although his decision was much grander, far beyond anything Uderbridge had to do on the bridge of the ward. 
He said goodbye, Nagumo did, to the leader of the first wave of torpedo bombers, uh, that is Mitsuo Fuchida, who had just turned 39. And then they raised the great Z flag, the Z flag that had first been raised in 1905 when the Japanese fleet defeated the Russians faithfully at the great battle of Tsushima. And the Z flag now flew proudly over Nagumo's flagship, the carrier Akaji. And then they radioed the message to all personnel, the same message that Togo had put up on his signal flags as Tsushima, the fate of the nation depends upon this battle. And then it was time for the carriers to turn into the wind, the six carriers of the Akito Butai. And as they did so, the flyers began to take off, 183 flyers, all in the first wave, a second wave to follow not long after that. They began roaring down the decks as the deckhands cheered themselves hoarse. Those flyers, by the way, thought of themselves for some reason as the best in the world, the elite of the elite. Every one of them had gone through rigorous training at Japanese flying academies. Uh, the, and the main one was so rigorous that only 1% of all applicants ever passed the written examination to get in. And once they were there, every one of these flyers had been woken up at 5 a.m. in the course of their studies, treated to a cold shower, and then brutalized and yelled at uh, and disciplined in all manner of ways uh, for all through the course of the study until it was thought they were so tough that they would never fear anything again at the same time that they were learning as much about the technological aspects of flying as they possibly could. No wonder they thought of themselves as the elite. If anything went wrong during those studies, if they committed any kind of infraction, the discipline could be terrible including, among other things, an order to stand on their tiptoes for a full hour if they stepped out of line. And those were the men who now took off from the decks of the Kido Butai. And as they did so, uh, most of them were wearing headbands reading Kisho, meaning certain victory. And after a little while, they began picking up Honolulu radio and using it to help them fly due south towards the island of Oahu. It was only about then that General Marshall and Admiral Stark, uh, Chief of Naval Operations, were told that the Japanese note that was going to be delivered that day to Secretary of State Cordell Hall mentioned a specific time of delivery for the diplomats to rely on. And that obviously indicated there's a specific time of delivery that the Japanese were going to go to war that day. Marshall immediately sent out a message alerting Pacific commanders to this. Stark did the same thing. But unfortunately, the messages were sent by telegraph, which meant delay. Someone should have just gotten on the phone, but nobody did that. The warning would come to Kimmel too late, and when General Short got the warning, long after the bombs began to fall, he simply crumpled up the note in disgust. At 7.02, 45 minutes after the planes launched off the carriers, uh, long before they had arrived over Oahu, a small crew manning a radar station at Opana in northern Oahu, right by Turtle Bay, which you can see on the map here, began to pick up a massive series of blips to the north. The blips seemed to be about 130 miles away. And these guys manning the radar station had never seen that kind of concentration before. It's completely new to them. They called the nearest lieutenant on duty to inform them uh, what they had seen the lieutenant simply said, don't worry about it. Those are probably B-17s that are due to be delivered today. They're just flying in. And so the radar guys had done their duty. There's nothing more to, for them to do. And in fact, there were B-17s coming in. They would arrive later that day, miraculously so, during the tail end of the Japanese attack. Uh, but the blips that these guys had seen were in fact the Japanese flyers. But again, nobody at Pearl Harbor was ever warned. And then finally, 40 minutes later, uh, closer to 745, the Japanese flyers, uh, now at 12,000 feet, were over lush green Oahu uh, at Waimea Point, which is uh, on this map, uh, just a little bit to the northwest between, as you can see, Kahuka Point and Halawea Point. Fuchida, the commander of the first wave, radioed the order to uh, all of those around him to charge, which meant there's going to be no turning back now. Over Oahu they went after 745. And then as you can see in the map, uh, they turned to, the, to port 
uh, once they got beyond the island so that they would enter Pearl Harbor from the south and from the west, uh, now at about 9,000 feet. At 7.53, Fuchida caught his first sight of the actual anchorage at Pearl Harbor. And to his delight, there were no American planes in the air. The attack was going to be a surprise. And so he delivered the famous prearranged signal, Torah, 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 which meant surprise. The only reason those syllables were chosen, Torah, Torah, was because they were so simple and so quick to send. It was only a coincidence that Torah, Torah means tiger in Japanese. The signal was chosen because of its brevity. Nagumo received the signal, didn't quite relax yet, although the attack was now going to be a surprise, at least he knew that. And so did Yamamoto, all the way back in Japan, reclining on a chair, uh, now relaxed a little bit from his standpoint, knowing that none of the fighters from the United States were in the air. It was now nearly 1 p.m. in Washington. Uh, Frank Franklin Roosevelt was working on his stamp collection. General Marshall was fretting about what he figured had to be an imminent attack somewhere. Admiral Kimmel was still at home. He had just received the report from the ward that a submarine had been attacked just outside of Pearl, but he wanted more confirmation before doing anything about it. It was now 7.55 and the bombs were just about to start to fall. A few Americans at Pearl looked up and for some of them, their first thought was the pilots were hopelessly negligent, had no idea what they were doing because the landing gear on the planes were down and the planes were still thousands of feet up in the air. And they would soon figure out there was a reason for that. These were not American planes at all. And then the bombs began to fall. The first one hit a little ramp uh, used by PBY flying boats at Ford Island in the middle of the harbor. And then shortly after that, more bombs began to fall, including one that struck the USS Arizona forward into the magazine where the ammunition was in the battleship, sending the Arizona up in a great pillar of flame and smoke and ash as great pieces of the ship, as well as human body parts, began to uh, go up into the air and fall down, often on observers and buildings on nearby Ford Island. The Arizona, as you know, uh, many of you know, is still leaking oil to this day. Uh, 80 years after Pearl Harbor, about nine quarts of oil every 24 hours. And it soon became clear to the Japanese that those modified thunderfish, the torpedoes, were working very well indeed. Uh, not only did they doom, or some of them doomed the Arizona, but they also doomed the USS Oklahoma, which completely overturned in just a matter of minutes during the first wave. And they also struck the West Virginia, that battleship, always known as the Weavy, very early on in the attack, other planes hit the dry dock at Pearl Harbor where Admiral Kimmel's flagship, the USS Pennsylvania, happened to be docked uh, in the Pennsylvania suffered more damage that way, which were going to have to be repaired. Within the first 15 minutes, a lot of this damage occurred as all was confusion and catastrophe at Pearl Harbor. General Short's fighter planes parked side by side, as I said earlier, were devastated by Japanese bombers. Again, early on in the attack, uh, just in the first few minutes, Kimmel, by now, was at his headquarters at Pearl, watching that first wave in disbelief and grief. He would later say, when a stray bullet grazed him just a little bit, that it would have been much better if the bullet had actually killed him, based upon what he saw. And he was certainly perfectly sincere when he said that. Uh, it was one of his deputies who flashed the fateful message back to Washington, air raid Pearl Harbor, air raid Pearl Harbor, this is no drill a message that FDR finally read at 1.40 p.m. Washington time, but he didn't believe it. He waited, awaited confirmation. Both he and Harry Hopkins and almost everybody else had always been convinced that although the Japanese would attack, very likely that week, uh, the attack was probably gonna be at the Philippines and Point South and not Pearl Harbor. Well, for nearly two weeks, uh, two hours, uh, the attack continued. Uh, as I said earlier, in two waves, one after the other. And it's amazing how low the Japanese fires were getting, uh, especially to release those torpedoes. Many Americans at Pearl, if they noticed anything about that, uh, could sometimes see the smiles of the Japanese pilots in the cockpit uh, as they flew by and dropped their bombs. Hundreds of men were in the water fighting for their lives, many of them caked with oil 
from sinking ships. Many men by now uh, were badly burned. Their hair burned off in many cases. Uh, if they found land at all, they would be moving around like zombies, not quite aware of what had actually befallen them, uh, hoping for medical attention when they could find them. Many men were burned in the water as oil slicks caught fire uh, at the height of the attack. It was chaos, it was confusion, it was disaster. But amidst it all, something wondrous happened. For all of Kimmel's faults, remember, he was a, a very dutiful, careful inspector uh, and a good trainer. And he had trained those crews at Pearl Harbor after he took command in February uh, as carefully as he could. And it may well be that the rigors of all that training and all those inspections now began to kick in. Men who'd been in the service, in many cases for less than six months, found their way to their battle stations. And when they could, they fought back on stricken battleships, on cruisers, on destroyers, on rooftop artillery platforms. One man with nothing else at hand threw oranges at the planes, but fight back they would if they could. They stayed at their guns, many of them, in the face of strafing Japanese gunfire, even at great risk to themselves. 60 men would win the Navy Cross on December 7th. 15 men would win the Medal of Honor on December 7th, including this man here, and that's Ensign Francis Flaherty of Charlotte, Michigan, who sacrificed his life, staying in one of the turrets of the capsizing Oklahoma, brandishing a flashlight so that crew members themselves could get to safety, even though that meant he would be entombed with the ship. And it also, as we talk about heroism on December 7th, it's worth pointing out, among many others, the story of this man, and that's machinist mate Robert Scott. And his job on the California, another battleship, stricken by the Japanese, was to man the air compressors, uh, keep the compressor going, so that the uh, anti-aircraft guns of the California could keep firing. Our torpedo hit close by, it flooded his station, but he refused to leave, shouting to his friends that his mission, his station was right where he was and he wasn't gonna leave it as long as those guns were firing. Uh, and indeed that was the last anybody would ever see of him. He did stay at his post to the very end. And off the entrance of Pearl was the USS Ward, guns blazing away at Japanese pilots as they went in and out of the, the, the southern coast of Oahu. Uh, Ward himself not only fired the first shot of the war, but he continued to fire outside Pearl Harbor as long as the, the Japanese were there. Small boats took to the harbor at great risk to themselves to rescue the men bobbing in the water if they could. American machine gunners dashed to their guns, managed to shoot down uh, planes, especially in the second wave of the Japanese attack. And then, maybe most improbably of all, the battleship Nevada, dating from 1916, struck by Japanese torpedoes and heavy bombs, her deck on fire, nevertheless got underway, pulling back into the east lock of Pearl Harbor, bound for the Pacific Ocean, her guns blazing away, the flag of the United States flying from its stern. Sailors on shore could see the Nevada on the sortie towards the Pacific, fighting back against the Japanese, against all odds. And many of them clapped and shouted themselves hoarse. Many of them cried at the sight of what the Nevada was doing. But soon Japanese planes swarmed over her. Uh, more men were killed. Three officers and 47 crew members were killed as the Nevada heroically uh, backed away and tried to give battle directly to the Japanese. And if uh, people remembered anything from that morning, uh, and maybe nothing else because of how bad it was, if they remembered anything, they remembered that site, the site of the Nevada, uh, beginning to try to take the war to the Japanese. And it was a, a hopeless venture. Eventually, uh, so many bombs hit the Nevada that her captain did the only thing he could do, uh, and that is run the Nevada aground before it could actually block the entrance to Pearl Harbor. The Nevada, though, as many of the ships of Pearl Harbor, would live to fight another day. And in June, on June 6, 1944, the USS Nevada would pulverize German positions in back of Omaha Beach. The con attack continued. Oh, and by the way, the destroyer Ward. Uh, would keep firing as long as there were planes to fire at, and the ward would serve through much of the war 
until about the same time as D-Day, uh, the summer of 1944, when a kamikaze attack off Luzon would uh, harm the ward so bad that it, it had to be sunk off the Philippines. And guess who was the man who was the captain of the USS O'Brien, another destroyer, given the mission to sink the ward officially off of Luzon, none other than William Uderbridge, one of the great coincidences of the Pacific War. Only five Army Air Force fighters managed to take off, but those five may have shot down seven Japanese planes. There's always been some dispute about that, uh, especially in the second wave. Now, one of the pilots, uh, George Welsh, was actually recommended for a Medal of Honor because of what he had done, but he did not get it because after all, he had taken off without orders. And so he didn't get the Medal of Honor. Fuchida and the others flew back to the carriers after the second wave. And then the question was, should there be maybe a third wave? This is always one of the great controversies people bring up about Pearl Harbor. Uh, was there a plan maybe, now that the battleships were listing and in seeking condition, at least many of them, maybe the next thing to do was to strike the oil tanks at Pearl Harbor. Here they are right in front of you. And uh, maybe the idea is uh, such an attack on the oil tanks might have really crippled the Pacific fleet uh, for quite some time. Maybe they would have actually had to go back to San Diego if that had happened. But in fact, the debate might not be worth having. The Japanese never thought of the oil tanks as a major target. That was always very much a, a, a subsidiary target, if anything. And, by, and I think most importantly, if they had launched a third wave, the resistance to the second wave was so thorough, thorough and effective, the Japanese, I think, lost 29 planes, that an attack on the oil tanks might not be worth the risk to all those flyers. Maybe they'd lose a lot more of these extremely well-trained, valuable pilots than they were prepared to lose. Uh, so not believing a third wave would actually succeed, and also doubting whether the ordinance on uh, the bombers would actually do much against these oil tanks, uh, ultimately, there was no serious consideration to launching a third wave. Nagumo thought himself fortunate with what that raid had achieved. Uh, eight battleships of the Pacific Fleet uh, crippled, other ships as well crippled at Pearl Harbor, a surprise attack that tactically seemed to have succeeded beyond the wildest dreams of Nagumo and very much uh, legitimizing the risk that Yamamoto had taken in planning and ordering this attack in the first place. And that was December 7th, 1941, uh, a date, of course, that not only would lose an in infamy, but that was utterly unforgettable in the grand context of world history. And maybe just to close, it would be a good idea to talk about what the ultimate effects of this attack was. I think the most important thing to point out was that, although it didn't look that way, looked like a great tactical success, uh, the fact was that only two of those battleships were lost for good. Six more would live to fight another day, as I said, including the Nevada. And the fact was that the gamble had really failed because the aircraft carriers weren't there. The only way this attack made any sense at all was to take out those aircraft carriers. Only that would have given the Japanese the initiative to do more or less what they liked, uh, not just for six months, but probably for longer than that. Only taking out the aircraft carriers would have allowed the Japanese to expand their imperial presence beyond New Guinea, beyond the Solomons, uh, maybe into where Fiji and New Caledonia are, a way that would ultimately, uh, if it all came to that, maybe based upon the notion of the gamble they were taking, maybe uh, make the United States think that ultimately they had to come to some negotiated deal with all the time and expense necessary to push the Japanese back. Uh, it was all a whole bunch of ifs, but it's maybe not useful speculating about it because the aircraft carriers weren't sunk. And as a result, among other things, the USS Lexington was there to help blunt the great Japanese advance towards Port Moresby in May of 1942. And that was the beginning of the end of the Japanese empire. Uh, because the carriers were there, uh, that meant Guadalcanal was possible. That meant an earlier beginning to the US counteroffensive in the Pacific. Uh, and ultimately that meant that not only did the Japanese have next to no chance of winning this war, they had literally no chance of winning this war. There are other aspects to uh, this, this whole question, of course, we might go into. But one thing to point out is, had the Japanese succeeded, had those aircraft carriers been sunk, uh, probably the only thing that definitely would have meant was a longer war. And if it was a longer war, that would have been disastrous in a way. We still would have won 
But if it was a longer war, that might have meant that the Soviet Union might have been able to claim the right to occupy part of Japan with ruinous results for the Japanese and maybe for the history of the world. But it didn't happen that way. Uh, instead, what happened was uh, the Japanese lost in humiliating fashion, a humiliating, disastrous, bloody, horrible loss that would eventually allow the Japanese, ironically, to become what they had never been before, and that is one of the richest nations in the world. Uh, so the humiliation that they feared in 1941 would eventually be the humiliation that would allow them uh, to grow more or less into the potential that they had always had as a, a great, formidable, industrial, prosperous power. Now then, uh, that's the end of our presentation. And we still have a little bit of time for uh, questions and answers and points as I stop my share. Uh, much of this is controversial. So if uh, anybody has some questions or comments, uh, please feel free to share them. Thank you, Dan. You, <laughs> you gave us another blockbuster presentation. OK, folks. Now, Dan is uh, in the middle of uh, getting ready for finals. And he tells us he's got students lined up outside his office door waiting to talk to him about exams. So we promised that we'd have him out of here by 2.45. So um, questions, folks, we are ready to take your questions. Let us hear from you. In the meantime, Dan, let's ask you the age old question. Did Roosevelt and Churchill know about this in advance? What do you think? No, there, there, there's no indication at all that they, they knew there was gonna be an attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, so, so no, that, that's something people bring up, but uh, there's no truth to it. Okay, we just wanted to check with that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, I want to go into, let me go, why can't I go into it? Okay, so, well, Mary says, thank you, Dan, once again, so interesting. You have a lot of fans here. Um, it looks like someone using um, the invite from Lorraine has their hand raised. Do you want me to allow them to talk? They can talk. Oh yeah, who who's who's got their hand raised? Hang on. I, I think it's actually the rain. Yeah. Here. Oh, why did the duty officer not report the uh, seeking of a, a mini sub? So the duty officer could at least have notified the army about this. And the big thing that would have happened, of course, if the seeking of that sub had actually amounted to something in the minds of American commanders at Pearl before Kimmel got there, would have been that there might have been a, a combat air patrol that the army could have had over Pearl, uh, waiting the possibility maybe of an air raid. Uh, but th the fact that that wasn't done is just an indication that everybody at Pearl, uh, despite the war warning back in November, still had a peacetime mindset. And so nobody wanted to take initiative to make an order like that since we were still at peace. The idea was just wait for Kimmel to get there and see what he thought. And by the time he got there, of course, it, it was much too late. Uh, he mm -hmm. was just getting that report, as I said, about the ward as the Japanese were approaching Pearl Harbor, and, and he was just leaving his house. So I think I think that's the answer, but they, you just had this mindset that we were still at peace, and uh, you wouldn't react in a way that anticipated the worst if you were still in a mindset where it's peacetime. Okay, Bob Lewis would like to know, did the Japanese learn from the British torpedo attack on yeah, the uh, Italian fleet at Toronto? Toronto. Yeah, they, they did learn from that. What, what they learned was that it was possible to make a torpedo attack in shallow water. And that, uh, of course, torpedoes could sink capital ships, uh, which had happened at Toronto. Uh, the, the thing about Toronto was that water wasn't 40 feet, that was 75 feet. So the Japanese were going to have some work to do. But they did know that if they managed to do the right research, it was possible to manipulate torpedoes so that they didn't need 100 feet. Uh, the British did it in 75 feet. So maybe they could do it in less than 40 feet. Uh, so that taught the Japanese that such an attack was possible and that tactically there were things they could do as long as they had the right brains working on it that would make such an attack succeed. Um, uh, and the Americans, uh, the British actually told the Americans, all, of course, all about what they did at Toronto, uh, but there was still that 40 feet factor. Uh, it, so there's no torpedo nets and nobody's, you know, minding it as something they'd have to worry about. Um, the person who had their and raise should yeah, okay. be able to talk now. So Lorraine Marquis, Lorraine, you've raised your hand and you can speak. So what's your question? Mute myself. I 
Didn't I use my hand intentionally? I think it's someone who used the invite from you. So I'm not sure that oh, they didn't I, I rename don't, I don't themselves. I understand, understand that. I don't know what happened there. Oh, um, okay. I, I followed, but we won't go into the detail, but I don't know okay. what to say. So but for whoever that person is, if you have your hand question. raised. Linda, standing. I have a, uh, my hand was raised. This is Arthur. Oh, hi, Arthur. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, my brother was uh, on the USS Maryland. He was a gunner's mate at the ripe old age of 18 and a half when he saw those bombers coming in. Yeah, but they were up against the docks mm -hmm. because uh, they had, you know, locked in there by the other ships that right. were adjacent to them. So they couldn't really participate in the battle. And also all their munitions were below decks. They couldn't get things up. They couldn't fire their, their he was, um, you know, the uh, five inch guns and so on couldn't fire, but they did pull a lot of the uh, West Virginia sailors that were in the water onto the Maryland. And so it was a very terrible situa situation in the way to grow up, uh, you know, yeah. for a teenager. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Gresh Lattimore has two questions. First, he says, okay. outstanding presentation. What was the effect on America First and the isolationist lobby? Uh, a lot of people think America First totally disappeared mm -hmm. after Pearl Harbor. Uh, and that's not quite true. There were, there were still some people, uh, even then, uh, who thought at least we should stay out of the war in, in Europe. So there was no question about declaring war in Japan, in, in, unless you were Jeanette Rankin, who voted against it in her capacity as a senator. Uh, but the big question was war with Germany. And it, it could be that Roosevelt would have had his hands full justifying a war with Germany at the same time that we were taking on Japan. So you still had the America's first crowd that had some clout that didn't want war with Germany. But that only lasted a few days because uh, three days later, after Pearl Harbor, Hitler himself declared war in the United States. And that took care of that. Uh, so, so the effect on America's first was that uh, a lot of them still didn't like the idea of us being at war, but that was not gonna be a political movement anymore. Uh, uh, we were at war and there was a, a good critical mass of opinion for much of the war, very much in favor uh, of what we were doing. Many people forget though, that uh, in the later stages of the war, a certain war weariness was setting in in the United States. It's very difficult to get recruits. We were very much dependent upon the draft, uh, especially later in the war. And you know, even at a relatively early stage in the war, uh, the draft was, was very, very important after all. Uh, and, th and that's why I say that, you know, maybe if the war had continued a long time, then uh, we would have been so intent on making sure the Soviet Union entered the war as a full-fledged ally to try to bring the war to conclusion as quickly as possible, that we probably would have agreed uh, to what we didn't agree to in 1945, which was Soviet occupation of Hokkaido. Uh, and maybe eventually a split in Japan as we eventually gone in Korea. Uh, mm. But uh, that's all speculation we'll never know because the carriers weren't there. <laughs> and his second question has to do with Admiral Kimmel. Uh, he, according to Gresh, he spent the rest of his life trying to defend his reputation. What was his post-war reputation? As a post-war reputation was not good among political figures in the general public. His fellow officers in the Navy, though, uh, many of them were afflicted with the idea that it could just as easily have been them. And uh, to his everlasting credit, Admiral Nimitz, when he took command at Pearl Harbor, told Kimmel that uh, he was just lucky he wasn't there. The same thing might have happened uh, if Nimitz had been there. Kimmel uh, went before a court-martial. The court-martial, on many grounds, uh, exonerated him. They found fault with him for not doing a bit more. Maybe there should have been more PBY flights, for example. But uh, he was generally not treated badly by the court-martial. He was treated badly by political figures. And what happened was eventually Secretary of Defense Forrestal decided not to accept the findings of the court-martial. Kimmel was never given another uh, command that, that amounted to anything. Uh, he essentially went into early retirement. And he had, he had to keep uh, the rank that he had I think before Pearl Harbor. I don't think he was able to retire uh, with his official rank. Uh, so he, he didn't fare well in, in most respects, but if you talk to people that were his peers, uh, a, a lot of them sympathized with his position because among other things, uh, he wasn't specifically told by Admiral Stark that you really must be prepared for an attack. Uh, the war warning seemed to indicate that the likelihood was different part of the world 
where the Japanese were, were going to attack. And he didn't know all the political background, uh, the other reasons why the US expected to attack very quickly, among other things, the diplomatic traffic that we had decoded that seemed to indicate they were about to attack. Kimmel didn't know anything about that. And that's one reason why some think a little bit better of him than at least the public did and political figures did. I did want to mention, uh, because I, I maybe I'll, I'll make this a trivia quiz for all of you. Uh, Kimmel, his uh, nickname was Mustafa because his name Kimmel reminded people of Kamil Ataturk, uh, mm -hmm. whose original name was Mustafa Kemal, uh, the, the man who helped win the Gallipoli campaign, was eventually leader of independent Turkey. So that's why he was Mustafa, because Kimmel sounds like Kemal. But here's your trivia quiz. The first person to enter into it with a yellow hand gets a prize. Why was Harold Stark nicknamed Betty? It's the worst nickname you could have, but he was Betty. So why is okay. he Betty? While you folks think of it, Roger Borgazzani has his hand raised. Okay. And Roger, you can talk now. Go ahead. Tell us your question <laughs> while everybody decides why Admiral okay. Stark yeah. was named okay. Betty. What role did the embargo of Japan play in the decision to expand in the Pacific? Well, uh, the, uh, it's important to recognize, first of all, that the Japanese, in principle, decided to expand before the embargo. Uh, they decided to do that not long after the Germans had seized the Netherlands uh, and much of France and were threatening Great Britain. And what the Japanese, especially their foreign minister, Matsuzaka, thought, uh, they thought the smart money was probably on Germany. And they felt that the thing for them to do was to seize those imperial Dutch, British, French possessions to the south because they'd be easy pickings now that the home countries were in such trouble, in some cases out of the war. So they decided to do that, uh, even though that meant probable war with the United States. They, they couldn't go south and still bypass the Philippines, they thought. But what made it a sense of urgency for them uh, was the embargo in part, because I don't think we had any choice but to embargo scrap iron and aviation fuel and the other things we wouldn't sell to the Japanese because they insisted on being in China. And when the Japanese moved into French Indochina as a way to buttress their strategic position in Southern China, naturally, in order to respond to that, we are not gonna sell them war materials, war materials that they were using in what was really a brutal, horrible, hideous war against the Chinese that the Japanese had embarked upon. So it was that embargo that actually put them in this position of when they had to launch the attack, uh, because as I said at the beginning, now this is their choice. Uh, if they don't have war materials, because we're embargoing them, if they don't have war materials, then they got a choice. They can withdraw from China, or they can accept war with the United States by going south and getting the materials where they were and where they had already decided they wanted to go anyway. What they should have done is the rational thing and withdraw from China, uh, but they didn't do that. They did the irrational thing. Uh, they embarked upon war with the United States knowing or believing that there was no way to get an American accommodation over China that would not involve them withdrawing. And it was that fateful decision uh, choosing pride uh, over any rational calculation of national interest that led them to the most ruinous of wars, which uh, laid their cities to ruin and uh, plunged the country into blood and, and fire. Uh, to the extent that by 1945, uh, people were astonished at the extent to which the Japan had been ruined. But it's something they should never have done. Uh, you, you don't embark upon a war thinking that maybe if all goes well, you get about a 5% chance of getting a negotiated peace. It's a horrible decision making. Thank you. Um, you don't have any takers. Well, we do. In guessing uh, about Betty, do you? Do you? Uh, well, actually. Uh, so I think you're going to have to wait a minute. Well, there Bill might be a Poole different. has his hand up. Mr. Horton. And Bill usually has something worthwhile, and John Rudy does too. So, uh, Bill, do you have an answer to the Betty question? I think someone had put it in the chat. Yes, yes, I do. Go okay. Ahead. He was named, uh, the nickname came from Molly Stark or Elizabeth Stark, the wife of General Stark, a revolutionary war hero. Yeah. Yeah, uh, because remember, uh, Stark had said before the Battle of Bennington, uh, we will drive the enemy away, or Molly Stark sleeps a widow tonight. 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 Sleeps a, uh, as everybody in New Hampshire knows, uh, that's what General Stark said. Uh, so he actually, sh he really should have been named Molly. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but but, but they, they chose Betty. Uh, it you know that might have been her official name, but but the story I heard was that they just didn't they just forgot the right name. Uh, but I, I think I like the idea that maybe that was her official name that I didn't know. Uh, 
but they, they so they chose Betty out of Elizabeth and not Molly, right. which is why everybody knows her. Okay, David Horton also is a historian as a Horton. plebe there, which I guess must mean West Point. No, it couldn't be West Point, the, the uh, Naval Academy. He received the nickname Betty after Elizabeth Page Stark. He knows her full name, the wife of Revolutionary War General John Stark, yeah. who was being commemorated at the time. Thank you, David. Thank you, Bill. And yeah. John Rudy, have we taken away your thunder? Were you going to say the same thing? I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Okay. I, th I think uh, I think Betty is better than Molly as a nickname. So I, I guess it's not so bad. And then, of course, we probably all know about Stark Industries. That's oh, where, yes, we do. Yeah, we know about that. Iron too. Man worked. Mm -hmm. Stark Industries? No. Yeah. He might be referring to Iron Man. Yeah. Yeah. But I, that, that's a little bit off topic, but yeah. yes. <laughs> okay. Lorraine Marquis, do you have your hand up again or is that an old symbol? I, yeah, that, that must be somebody else. Okay. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, yeah, to say the least. Okay, fine. All right, good. Then uh, we have time for one more question if, if it's coming in and then we're going to let Dan loose on his students or the students loose on Dan, I'm not sure which it will be. <laughs> Let's see if we've got anything. Um, um, Bob Lewis, I, did you answer this, had asked if the Japanese used dive bombers? Yeah. Uh -huh. Was that question asked? Yeah, tor uh, torpedo bombers and other bombers as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fine. So the question is dive bombers. Do they use dive bombers? Talk. Uh, this is dive bombers now, as opposed to torpedo bombers. They're different. Well, yeah, I, I, as I recall, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Then I think, I think we've covered everybody who wanted to be covered. Okay. Well, wow, this was a very enthusiastic Q and A. Thank you, everyone, for your questions, Dan. This was wonderful, but we expected no less because you have a you have a reputation with us. Well, thank, thank you, all of you. It's good to see you again. And, it, was a, uh, it was wonderful. Hope to see you soon. Thank you, and uh, good luck with the semester, with all your exams. And I know we'll be seeing you again in, in, in the new year. So thank you, everybody. This concludes right. our presentation. We, bye -bye. Th we thank you for being with us. This is December. Happy holidays to you all. Happy New Year. And the next time we see you will be in Gulp 2022. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank, Thank you, Dan. Dan. Thank you, Linda. Bye -bye. Thank you. Everyone.